Fourier coefficients and polynomials are named for the French mathematician Joseph Fourier. In his speech to the French Academy of Science in 1807, Fourier proposed that these polynomials could be used to, to approximate arbitrary functions on the interval negative pi pi. Unfortunately, the, the mathematicians at the time did not agree with Fourier, and his ideas did not catch on until I... <laughs> The equation for Fourier's polynomials is listed here. It shows that Fourier's polynomial is equal to a constant, a sub zero, plus the sum of n amount of his coefficients. The coefficients listed in this equation are solved for in these three equations here, a sub zero, a sub n, and, a, and b sub n. First, we're going to calculate a sub zero. also listed here for the function f equals x. As you can see, a sub 0 equals 1 over 2 L, which is half the period. Um, in the, and the integral from negative L to L of, F of the equation. Uh, for this equation, a sub 0 equals 1 over 2 pi, which is half the interval. Um, and times the integral from pi, uh, negative pi to pi of the function. f at x is also happens to be an odd function, which means that f at negative x equals negative f at x. This is significant because, as you can see in the graph, if you were to take the integral from pi to negative pi, it would just be zero because the two halves cancel each other out. Therefore, we can say that a sub zero equals one over two n times zero, which of course is just zero. Therefore, a sub zero is zero. Next, we'll calculate a sub n for all n's. So you can see here, a sub n equals one over uh, one half of the period from negative L to L of the function times the cosine of n, the coefficient, times pi times x over L. You can see here, that would mean that uh, a sub n equals 1 over pi from negative pi to pi of the function f of at x, which equals x, times cosine uh, n times x, because the period is, or one half the period is pi, and you have pi in there, so you can just cross them out. Um, next, since f at x is an odd function, and cosine n times x is an even function, we can times them together and get an odd function. And Sean will show you how to do it. To demonstrate this property, that an odd function multiplied by an even function will be an odd function, we have the following two functions, f of x equals x squared and f of x equals x. An odd function is a function where negative f of x equals f of negative x. And an even function is a function where f of negative x equals f of x. When we multiply x squared by x, we get x to the third, which, as Desmos will show, is an odd function. Thanks, Sean. And because of that, this function now, um, from the interval of negative pi to pi of an odd function, will just equal zero, as we stated earlier, and will prove later. Therefore, a and n for any n will equal 1 over pi times 0, which of course is just 0. And that holds true for all n's. Now we will solve for b sub n. b sub n equals 1 over l times the integral from negative l to l of f of x sine of n pi x over l. To begin, we plugged in for L. L is equal to half the period, so it is equal to pi. Then, we used U sub, or integration by parts, to solve the integral. We put U equal to x and dV equal to sine of nx dx. The integral of x is dx, and the, I mean, sorry, the derivative of x 
and the integral of sine of nx dx is negative 1 over n cosine of nx. Then we multiplied u by v and took the integral of v dv, so we had negative x, so we had this equation. From here, we took the integral of negative 1 over n cosine of nx. This brought us to this point in the equation where we had negative x over n cosine of nx plus 1 over n squared sine of nx. Since this function is even, we, were able to, we knew that the integral of this from negative pi to pi is equal to the integral of it from 0 to pi times 2. The 1 over pi comes from up here. We just took it down. Here, we plugged in for pi and 0. So we plugged in first all for pi and then subtracted by plugging when we plugged in for 0. When you plug in for 0, everything is actually equal to 0. Um, from here, we simplified and then we multiplied 2 over pi in to get this. Continuing from where we left off, we have the equation here. If you take a careful look at this equation, you'll see the cosine and sine function both have pi multiplied by n in the inside. Here, I've just shown a unit circle. On this unit circle, you can see that here is 0, and then it goes pi, then 2 pi, then 3 pi, then 4 pi, and so on. You can almost disregard the pi because as shown up here, it is n times pi, so the n would be the number next to pi, so 2, 4, 3, or 5. This shows that this, the value for sine of n pi bounces between, sine, between 0 and 0, so sine of n pi will always equal 0, making this half of the equation equal to 0. On the other hand, the value of cosine of n pi bounces between, cosine, it bounces between 1 and negative 1 depending on whether n is positive, is it uh, even or odd. So, we are left, after simplifying and removing sine, we are left with negative 2 over n times 1 if n is even, and negative 1 if n is odd. We can further simplify this and find that it is 2 over n, and this is positive if n is odd, and negative if n is even. Finally, we plug this in and solve for b, b sub n through 1 through 5. So we get b sub 1 equals 2, b sub 2 equals negative 1, b sub 3 equals 2 thirds, b sub 4 equals negative 1 half, and b sub 5 equals... Oh, Sean. You... Let's get back to p sub n. Here we can see the equation for p sub n. Since a sub 0 is just 0, we can just ignore that. And because uh, we found that a sub n is 0, we can just ignore that portion. So then we get, for this, we're trying to calculate uh, p sub 5. So we get the sum of from n equals 1 to 5 equals b sub n times sine nx. So here we calculated it. Uh, p sub 5 of x equals 2, which is the first uh, coefficient that we found, sine x plus negative sine 2x plus 2 thirds sine 3x plus negative 1 half sine 4x plus 2 fifths sine 5x. Here we have the graph of f of x, which is the function we are meant the Fourier, using the Fourier polynomial to emulate. emulate. We have the first instance of the Fourier polynomial, so if big N had been equal to 1, this is what we would have. But you'll notice that as we add more instances of N, the graph becomes more and more accurate to the graph we are meant to be emulating. If we add all five instances of N, the following is what we have. Now we're going to prove that for an odd function, the integral of f at negative c to c uh, is always 0. Here we can see that if we split these two up, we get um, the integral from negative c to 0 and the integral from 0 to c. Next, we can uh, use one of our laws 
and pull out a negative and switch the C to the top. Then using a U sub, we find that the integral from zero to C of F at negative U uh, DU plus uh, the integral from zero to C F at X DX. And since X, F at X is an odd function, we can say that F at negative U equals negative F at U. Therefore, we can substitute a little bit. And we find that negative, uh, the integral from zero to C of F at DU DU plus the integral of zero to C F at X DX. Then we can solve these two and find that the, uh, it equals zero. Just to clarify on that last step, how we get from this to zero. We solve the integral and we're using big F to stand for the integral of F of X. And we find this, that negative in parentheses, big F of C minus big F of zero plus big F of C minus big F of zero is equal to the integral. And then we find that negative big F of C plus big F of C and we find it is all equal to zero. Hey Jack, did you notice any patterns when you did part A? I did, Matt Chow. As you can see in part A, we were able to cross out this part of the function because it was uh, because f and x happened to be odd. I conjecture, if that's a verb, that, <laughs> that for any odd function, uh, this part, a sub n, will be zero, and this part won't matter. Conversely, if uh, f at x is an even function, uh, b sub n will cross out, and this part of the equation will not matter. First, let's look at a sub n. As we proved earlier, um, the integral of a function from any negative bound to any positive bound, as long as they're the same, will be zero. So if we look at a sub n, if we take f at x as a positive function, or uh, sorry, f of x as an odd function, and cosine will always be an even function, if we times the two together, we will always get an odd function, like we proved earlier in this video. Therefore, the, uh, the integral of that odd function will be zero, so a won't matter. Conversely, if we look at b sub n, if f at x is an even function, and sine is always odd, we'll get an odd function once again. And like we said before, uh, the integral of an odd function from the same bounds is uh, zero. Therefore, we can disregard b sub n. So why did Fourier think this would be a good technique for approximating periodic functions? Well, early ideas of decomposing a periodic function to the sum of simple oscillating functions date back to the 3rd century BC when ancient astronomers proposed an empiric model of planetary motion. Fourier introduced the series for purposes of solving the heat equation in a metal plate. He published his initial results in his 1807 memoir and published it in his book, The Analytical Theory of Heat, in 1822. There are three important contributions in this work, but the most relevant is the mathematical one. Fourier claimed that any function of a variable, whether continuous or discontinuous, can be expanded in a series of signs of multiples of the variable, although this result is not correct without additional conditions. Fourier's observation that some discontinuous functions are the sum of infinite series was a breakthrough. Prior to Fourier's work, no solution to the heat equation was known in the general case, although particular solutions were known if the heat source behaved in a simple way in particular, if the heat source was a sine or cosine wave. These simple solutions are now sometimes called Asian solutions. Fourier's idea was to model a, compl a complicated heat source as a superposition or linear combination, an expression constructed from a set of terms by multiplying each term by a constant and adding the results, of simple sine and cosine waves, and to write the solution as a superposition of the corresponding Asian solutions. This superposition, or linear combination, is called the Fourier sequence. Although the orig original motivation was to solve the heat equation, the same techniques could be applied to a wide array of mathematical and physical problems 
especially those involving linear differential equations with constant coefficients, for which the each solutions are sinusoids. The Fourier series has many such applications in electrical engineering, vibration analysis, acoustics, optics, and many other things.